Hello everyone. Uh, so far, we have been uh, looking at amplitude modulated sensors and uh, we took the specific example of uh, gas spectroscopy and then went on to ask the question uh, whether uh, we can extend gas spectroscopy for uh, standoff detection that is actually can we monitor uh, gases from a remote location. And uh, we saw in the last lecture that we could do this by uh, going to uh, optical time domain reflectometry, right. So, where we uh, essentially have a laser that is uh, sending a pulse of light and uh, that is interacting with the uh, remote location, the, the gases in the remote location and um, because of that interaction, they, uh, there might be uh, some absorption happening to those uh, uh, pulses and uh, then the backscattered light we are collecting using our receiver, uh, we can actually see uh, you know some, some uh, distribution like this uh, with respect to a resonant wavelength and a non-resonant wavelength, we can actually do um, uh, remote gas uh, spectroscopy. And then we uh, said ok, let us actually look at a simpler problem uh, to understand this optical time domain reflectometry which is the key for this uh, standoff detection. And we said ok, let us actually uh, learn to uh, build a OTDR uh, using uh, an optical fiber configuration. Right, and this we will see is useful for some of the other sensing applications that we will demonstrate later on uh, in the semester. But uh, let us, uh, uh, you know, just look at it from the perspective of understanding how an optical time domain reflectometer can be designed. Okay, so so that's what we're going to do. Uh, how do you de design uh, such a, a reflectometer, such an OTDR instrument? for any given application, ok. So, we ask the question how to design an OTDR and let us say uh, when you talk about design, you need to adhere to some specifications. One of the key specifications as far as an OTDR is concerned is the dynamic range. So, how to design an OTDR? Uh, with uh, dynamic range of uh, 20 dB, ok. So, um, so what is dynamic range? The It is basically the range of um, power values that we can detect uh, using our OTDR. Uh, and, and what power values are these? These are the backscattered uh, power values. Right, so uh, we want to we want to support a dynamic range of 20 dB, which is actually a factor of 100. And uh, we have to be careful about defining this uh, because what we are typically interested in is the single pass loss. So uh, this dynamic range uh, that we want, let's say, is with respect to a single pass. Um, and of course, you know what you are seeing. Uh, in your receiver as far as an OTDR is concerned is the backscattered signal. So, there is actually a round trip involved, ok. Um, so, the overall loss that we want to support may be 40 dB, but as far as the, uh, the single pass loss is concerned that corresponds to a maximum of 20 dB, ok. So, let us see how we will go about designing this. Now, um, we saw that of course, we to design an OTDR, we need a uh, laser, right? If it if it's an uh, going to be sitting inside an instrument, it may be a compact laser like a semiconductor laser, and uh, we are looking at uh, the fiber coupled configuration. So we said uh, uh, we typically use a circulator, right, which directs light from port one to port two, and uh, port two is where we have our uh, uh, sensing fiber, ok. Uh, so, this is going to this uh, distant location and getting information back from that. Um, and then any back reflected light we are collecting at port 3 
and we are uh, directing it to uh, receiver okay so this is the overall configuration that we want to uh, support okay now um, let us say uh, that uh, pl uh, denotes the power that we are uh, emitting from this laser um, so, what is the typical time of power levels that we are looking at? Um, if you are talking about a semiconductor laser, uh, it is usually a, a fabric or laser. Uh, if you are looking at a pulsed semiconductor laser, you can get uh, power levels in the order of uh, 100 milliwatts. Okay. So, so, this could be in the order of uh, plus 20 dBm. Okay. And uh, then we uh, go through some uh, losses um, because of the circulator. Uh, there is a loss for light going from 1 to uh, 2 and then again there is another loss for light going from 2 to 3. So, let us actually call that loss as C. Okay. C is actually a negative value mind you because it is loss. Uh, right. So, um, uh, you know, typically it's like uh, one dB per uh, uh, pass. Uh, so uh, C could be a value of minus two dB typically. Okay. Uh, so now let's look at uh, the power evolution along the length of fiber. So that will help us understand um, this uh, problem that we are uh, looking at. Okay. Uh, this design problem that we are looking at. So this is as a function of uh, distance uh, like the single pass distance. So, you measure this as a function of time and you correct it with the velocity and for as well as the round trip time. So, you can actually get this as a function of distance. Okay. So, let us look at the typical power levels that we would uh, 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 encounter. Right. Now, if you just launch this pulse and the pulse is going to actually, so this is what we are talking about is launching a pulse of light down the fiber and as the pulse is propagating down the fiber, it is going to uh, reflect uh, some, some of the light. Let us say um, the pulse width in time corresponds to uh, tau p and uh, the corresponding uh, uh, width of the pulse can be uh, termed as w okay um, so as it uh, propagates down the fiber so you're starting with a value so this is actually uh, in in terms of power we are uh, tracking this so you start with pl um, but PL plus C uh, corresponds to the power level over here. Um, we are saying plus C because uh, C is actually a negative number, right? Mind, remember that. So let us call this P naught. Okay. So if you track uh, P naught, um, so the as a function of distance, of course, uh, it is going to go down as a function of distance, right? So, uh, how does it go down? It goes down exponentially because of the attenuation, you know, you apply a Bayes law and uh, you say, uh, uh, you know, it, it goes to exponential uh, uh, decay in terms of the uh, power level, but then uh, uh, let us say we are looking at this power in this uh, dB scale, uh, specifically in the dBm scale. Okay, so uh, reference to a milliwatt. So, uh, so we are looking at p naught e power minus alpha z type of loss, where alpha is uh, a typical value is about uh, 0.2 dB per kilometer. If you take a standard single mode fiber uh, at a wavelength of uh, 1550 nanometers. Let us say we are doing all of this at 1550 nanometers. Okay. Um, so, this is actually the power that is present in the pulse. The pulse is decaying. Uh, remember the, the 
strength of the pulse is decaying so the, that's actually tracking the power in the pulse as it goes to the distant location okay um, but what we are really interested in is what is the power that is uh, backscattered and uh, when it comes to backscattering uh, we have to consider basically this uh, Rayleigh backscattering coefficient r so that actually defines the power that is uh, 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 that is that is backscattered so let's actually denote that in a different color so you say this is uh, p naught plus r once again i'm using plus r because we have defined the backscattering coefficient i think towards the end of the last lecture we defined it as uh, a negative value it's actually a very small fraction of the incident light okay so that's why it's a negative value um, and, and so let's say that R is actually the backscattering coefficient. So this level represents the power that would be uh, back reflected uh, from the front end of the fiber from, from this location here. Um, but as it's propagating down the fiber, you will um, have you know lesser uh, incident power. So correspondingly, there will be lesser back reflected power. But uh, specifically, if you are looking at the power that's reaching the receiver, um, that will be something like this. It will be a larger slope. Um, how large? Well, it will be twice the slope of, of this line. Why is that? Because you are not only uh, losing power as you are propagating towards the distant location, but also losing power uh, for the back reflected light coming back uh, to, to the receiver. Okay, So this is going to be uh, corresponding to twice the uh, loss. So you, you will have P naught e power minus 2 alpha z. Okay, Because this is, this is basically the loss at the receiver which is corresponding to the round trip uh, propagation. Okay. Um, so that actually says, okay, you have a quite a, remember this is all in dB scale. So the amount of power that you get is, it could be quite low. And, um, uh, and, and then you need to have a very sensitive uh, detector to pick up this uh, radiation. Let's say the detector uh, sensitivity is somewhere along this value. Right, so let's call this uh, PD corresponds to the detector uh, sensitivity. That's the minimum uh, detectable power uh, at the receiver. Okay, so that corresponds to that value. Um, and we see that okay, we can actually pick up power values up to this point, uh, but uh, beyond that, it's actually uh, you know, it's going into the noise, so you're not able to retrieve uh, any signal beyond uh, this this distance over here. Okay. Um, however, we know that uh, we could improve the situation. How do we improve the situation? Well, we know that we could, uh, since the properties of the fiber is not changing over uh, a few minutes, typically. Uh, you can afford to get one trace and then you shoot another pulse, get another trace and shoot another pulse, get another trace and so on and add all these traces. So we saw previously that when we add all these traces, uh, right, we are essentially going through averaging. Right, so uh, we we can we can essentially get we can do averaging over multiple um, traces, okay. And uh, so if you have n traces, your signal to noise uh, ratio could improve by a, um, a factor of uh, uh, root n. So uh, if you were to write it as uh, signal to noise improvement ratio that corresponds to root of n okay and that is in uh, just linear units if you want to write this in uh, 
uh, log scale basically you say this is uh, 10 log base 10 because we are dealing with power values. So, that is where it is uh, base 10 of uh, root of n and uh, it is convenient to do this uh, n in terms of uh, 2 power so many uh, averages. Okay. So, then you can get a, a round number. So, if uh, n can be expressed as 2 power small n, okay, uh, then you can actually uh, represent this uh, in, in log of base 2 and if you do that, if you convert this to base 2, what you see this is 1.5 log of base 2, 2 power n. Okay. So, uh, let us just do a quick uh, calculation here. So, let us say uh, n is uh, 1024, right. So, uh, 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 well, we will we'll pick a even, uh, uh, yeah, okay, let us say 1024. So, that corresponds to um, n or uh, uh, root of n will be somewhere around 32 or something, right and uh, log of 32 will will correspond to a factor of uh, uh, 15 right so that will this 10 log base 10 of uh, 32 will correspond to about 15 uh, db right so similarly um, 2 power n if you say the, then uh, 1024 averages will correspond to 2 power 10 okay so small n equal to 10 and uh, then if you substitute that you will get uh, uh, you know this is going to be equal to 15 db for uh, n equals to uh, in this case uh, 1024 right 1024 average so so yeah uh, this this snir can be expressed as, uh, uh, as as this value so, if you consider all of this, uh, let us just go back to where we were, right. So, if you consider this situation, what we are saying here is now because of this uh, uh, signal to noise ratio improvement, you are able to bring down the level even lesser. So, so this is actually PD uh, plus uh, uh, SNIR. Okay, that that will be a even smaller uh, number. Okay, um, sorry, uh, I should say PD minus SNIR because it's uh, it's SNIR is the improvement. So we, like we talked about, it's 15 dB improvement. So it will be even smaller value. So this is the signal to noise ratio that you are improvement that you are achieving through uh, for example averaging. So, what is the effect of that? Now, effect of that is that you are able to uh, pick up uh, information up to this point. Okay. Now, uh, let us actually define uh, dynamic uh, range. So, dynamic range is corresponding to the range of values that you can detect uh, reliably. Okay. So, you are able to detect values from this is the maximum value that you can pick up right because that is that is the maximum value from uh, the closest end of the fiber and the farthest end of the fiber from which you can pick up is uh, corresponding to this uh, distance. Okay. Um, but mind you this is actually going through round trip so, this corresponds to 2 times the dynamic range as far as uh, uh, a single, so uh, this dynamic range uh, call it a dr, right. We want a single pass dynamic range of 20 dB. So, uh, we will have to multiply that by 2 here because everything is going through a round trip as far as this chart is concerned, okay. So, now uh, let us write an expression uh, you know balancing all these off and, and that expression could be useful in determining um, for example, what is the receiver sensitivity required to, uh, to 
support a dynamic range of 20 dB. Okay. So, let us uh, look at that. Um, so, what we are saying is we are starting with P L uh, plus C plus R right and uh, minus from from this level you go minus 2 times dr then you would have reached this point this this level over here which corresponds to pd minus snir right so that is the equation that represents uh, you know how far you are going to be able to uh, what is the range of uh, uh, values that you are going to be able to support using this OTDR. Okay. So, let us just uh, rearrange terms. Uh, so, what we are, uh, uh, so we can, we can just write this as PL minus PD plus SNIR that is equal to uh, minus of C plus R mind you both c and r are negative values so minus of this is going to just become a positive value and uh, plus uh, 2 times dr okay so this uh, expression is what is called the otdr makers equation so, whenever somebody is trying to make an OTDR, um, they, they essentially have to refer to this uh, expression. Okay. So, now, uh, so we want to now define uh, or, or basically design something uh, for 20 dB. So, let us basically say that uh, uh, you start with plus 20 dBm and then uh, uh, C correspond to minus uh, 2 dB, let us say is the value that you want to take for C. Uh, so, let us actually see how this uh, will work out. Okay. Just go to a fresh page for this. So, let me just uh, write this expression once again P L minus P D plus S N I R is equal to minus R plus C or C plus R whichever way. Uh, plus uh, 2 times dr right so what we need is uh, uh, for dr or 20 dB right that is the single pass uh, dynamic range that we want to support um, we are starting with pl equals to plus 20 dBm right um, let us say uh, C equal to minus 2 dB. Okay. Uh, R is a value that depends on the pulse width. Okay. We saw that uh, the R is the Rayleigh backscattering coefficient uh, per unit pulse width corresponds to minus uh, 52 dB uh, per uh, microsecond. Right. That is that is what we were uh, looking at at 1550. So, let us say uh, we let us assume that we are using 1 microsecond. So, uh, 1 microsecond pulse. So, that this corresponds to minus 52 dB. So, assume assume that uh, the pulse width tau p is uh, 1 microsecond. Okay. And uh, let us say uh, we are uh, assuming n equals to uh, 2 power 16 averages. 2 power 16 is indeed a, a fairly large number. Uh, so, 2 power uh, 14 will be uh, 2 power 16 will be corresponding to uh, 64,000 averages. Um, you say that is actually a fairly uh, uh, large number of averages, but then if you consider the fact that um, you do these averages every uh, after every round trip. Okay. So, let us just make some uh, calculation here. If alpha is 0.2 dB per kilometer, what is the length of fiber that you can support? Uh, with this uh, 20 dB dynamic range. So, if it is a continuous length of fiber, 
um, that would correspond to 100 kilometers right because 20 db uh, so length equal to 20 db divided by 0.2 db per kilometer so that corresponds to 100 kilometers okay so to go 100 kilometers and then come back right when you look at the round trip uh, delay corresponding to that so that is basically uh, uh, it's 2 into 100 kilometers 100 into 10 power 3 divided by the uh, speed of light in this fiber which you can approximate to 2 into 10 power 8 right so then if you do the calculation you'll find that this is corresponding to 1 millisecond so in 1 millisecond you are able to go all the way down to the end of the fiber and come back um, so every 1 millisecond you can actually do an uh, average so if you are talking about 64,000 averages that will be done in 64 seconds and of course there will be some uh, overhead uh, in, in processing and so on so you will uh, maybe have like uh, uh, you know 100 seconds or uh, 120 seconds let's say that's two minutes so in two minutes you can actually do 2 power 16 averages and if you do 2 power 16 averages you can expect a signal to noise ratio improvement of uh, 1.5 log base 2 2 power 16 so 16 multiplied by 2 1.5 b 24 db right so you can you can get a snir of 24 db by doing this now the question is uh, uh, what should be the value of uh, PD the detector sensitivity okay what is the minimum power uh, that you should be able to detect okay so let's actually put all these numbers together in, in this expression so you have 20 minus PD plus 24 equals to minus of minus 52 minus 2 right for r and c plus uh, 2 multiplied by 20 okay so all these uh, mind you we are all doing everything in db scale right so if you do the math you will find that pd uh, this corresponds to 44 so you take it over there and this corresponds to um, 54 um, and that's a positive value so uh, 54 minus 44 plus uh, 40 that would correspond to just uh, do that so this is minus 44 minus 54 plus 40 so mm, that corresponds to minus uh, Uh, minus uh, 14 and and uh, minus uh, 44 so that corresponds to minus uh, 58 uh, dbm right so that's actually a fairly uh, small uh, value right um, so I think I made a mistake here so this is minus PD so this is uh, when you're talking about PD you're taking this thing but then this will be plus and then uh, uh, 44 and then this is uh, minus 54 and this is minus 40. So if you do this, uh, this is minus 94 plus 44, so this will be minus 50 dBm, right? So that is actually the sensitivity that you require. Uh, so it, this minus 50, minus 60 dBm is actually uh, 1 nanowatt, so minus 50 dBm will correspond to 10 uh, nanowatts of power. 
okay. So, you are supposed to pick up uh, a fairly small uh, value of power and not only that, um, suppose you are uh, looking at uh, building a receiver to pick this up, uh, you want to build a receiver such that uh, you have enough trans impedance gain so that the output of your amplifier chain uh, fills the ADC. Let us say the ADC is about 1 volt uh, full scale, right. So, the trans impedance, so what we are talking about is uh, you have the front end and then going on to a TIA and then maybe uh, another set of amplifiers and then voltage amplifiers and then you are going getting to the ADC. If the ADC is actually 0 to 1 volt, uh, you need to fill the ADC. So, the trans impedance gain that you require is basically 1 volt uh, should be the output of your voltage amplifier divided by whatever you have at the input. Uh, and let us say uh, if you are using a PIN photodiode, a PIN photodiode um, at uh, 1550 will uh, typically give you a responsivity of 1 amp per watt. So, for 10 nano watts, you will get 10 nano amps as the photo current. And so, if you substitute this, you get about 10 power 8 ohms. So, that is the requirement as far as the transipidence gain is concerned. So, you need to actually have a fairly uh, large gain uh, so that you can uh, uh, you know represent uh, this uh, uh, the, the uh, what do you call the, the lowest power uh, with, uh, with fairly high values ok. So, of course, um, ok. Uh, it may be actually a little less than that because of the fact that this is um, corresponding to the uh, power that we have at uh, this location, right. And uh, uh, so, your uh, that is the minimum power that we have. The maximum power corresponds to the power that we have at this location. Um, so, at this location uh, and this is what needs to fill the ADC, ok. So, um, so at this location it is uh, basically 20 dBm, um, you know, uh, minus uh, 54. Um, so, that is about minus 34, so that is about a microwatt, uh, something the order of microwatts of power. So, in reality, uh, if you consider that aspect then maybe uh, you do not need to have uh, uh, this high a trans impedance gain, right. So, you uh, let us say you have uh, something in the order of uh, 1 microwatt uh, from the closest end of the fiber, then uh, you can just say this is corresponding to 1 uh, microamp of uh, uh, current and then in that case the tram transipidence gain value uh, need not be more than uh, 10 power 6. So, it, it helps you a little bit in, in, in that sense, ok. Um, so, uh, but that is still a fairly large value. So, you need to uh, design it such that the TIA uh, takes up most of your uh, load in terms of the gain. Uh, so, you, you may want to uh, you know try to achieve as much gain as possible from the TIA stage itself. Now, the question is can you just achieve this transipidence gain with just the TIA uh, feedback resistance 1 meg ohm? Can possibly, but what is the constraint there? Uh, we know that when you talk about the F 3 dB of a TIA, we saw that previously that corresponds to the gain bandwidth divided by 2 pi R F C F plus C D and so on, right. So, all the other capacitances. So, 
it's limited by the gain bandwidth of the op amp that you are using here right so you may not be able to actually uh, uh, get uh, 1 mega ohm transipedance gain from this stage itself because in that case your uh, f3db can be uh, quite limited right so then you ask the question why do you need a large f3db well you need to actually pick up the pulse the backscattered pulse so you want to represent the pulse as uh, well as possible so let us actually uh, look into that aspect uh, in little more detail okay so let's say we are uh, having a pulse uh, like we talked about we, we have so far assumed this is actually a uh, one uh, microsecond pulse so what is the corresponding uh, width of the pulse um, or rather what we are interested in is uh, what is the corresponding uh, spatial resolution what is the minimum distance that you can resolve okay um, between uh, two uh, different events uh, so that will correspond to Vg that is the group velocity of light in the fiber multiplied by uh, tau p but because it is actually a round trip configuration you have to divide that by 2 ok. So Vg is uh, 2 into 10 power 8 meters per second tau p is 10 power minus 6 so divided by 2 if you do the math uh, so that will correspond to 100 uh, meters ok. So, you can get 100 meter spatial resolution provided you have uh, a bandwidth in your receiver that can uh, capture this 1 microsecond pulse ok. So, let us actually calculate the bandwidth required at the receiver to uh, capture this pulse. So, then you say that um, for a, a linear transform limited uh, pulse uh, your bandwidth is given by 0.35 multiplied by 1 over uh, the rise time right the rise time that you are trying to uh, support. Now, uh, to get a 1 microsecond pulse uh, you do not need to get the entire pulse but I mean you do not need to see the, the square pulse because if you want to get the square pulse then your bandwidth required will be uh, very large but even if you have some representation of the pulse that is probably ok. So, if you are able to get uh, something something like this that is still good enough. So, let us actually assume that uh, tau r corresponds to uh, half a microsecond nominally um, and if you consider that then uh, 1 over tau r corresponds to 2 megahertz uh, multiplied by 0.35 so that corresponds to 0.7 megahertz. So, what you want to do is you want to see if 0.7 megahertz is uh, supported um, with the when, when you uh, you know substitute in this expression. So, what is the maximum value of uh, Rf that you can support uh, uh, and still maintain you know 0.7 uh, megahertz f3 dB ok. So, that is the question. So, in, in some cases it may be that you are not able to uh, get uh, this much transipedance gain uh, from the TIA itself because of this limitation and so you will have to go to one more stage uh, beyond that uh, to, to actually get this uh, total transipedance gain ok. So, that is actually the, uh, the uh, typical uh, issues that goes into uh, design of a OTDR. Now, I will just uh, end with one uh, last thought. Um, what if we want to support uh, let us say 1 meter spatial resolution 
if you want to uh, support 1 meter spatial resolution then uh, your uh, pulse width right the round trip uh, considering the round trip propagation the pulse width should be 10 uh, nanoseconds here we have a pulse width of 10 uh, 1 microsecond is what we consider but if you want to have much finer uh, spatial resolution then tau p has to be 10 nanoseconds and in this case the bandwidth required will be uh, you know a factor of 100 more so that will correspond to 70 megahertz so if uh, if you want to actually support 70 megahertz bandwidth then you go back and you look at this and then you say if you want to get 70 megahertz bandwidth then my transipedance gain um, as uh, uh, you know the the gain that you can get from my transipedance amplifier is going to be even lesser okay and so in that sort of a design you may need one or maybe even two more amplifiers beyond that and uh, that is uh, to, to make up for this transipedance gain that you are trying to achieve okay and uh, so what is the downside of that well the downside is that uh, with each amplifier that you are adding you bring in extra noise figure so that uh, degrades the signal to noise ratio that degrades the uh, PD value that you can achieve okay so and of course you also have to recognize that if you have uh, one microsecond uh, uh, pulse width is you have minus 52 dB but if you have uh, 10 uh, nanosecond pulse width you have minus 72 dB so already your PD is actually uh, going to be minus 50 dBm um, sorry minus 70 dBm if you are considering uh, you know 1 meter spatial resolution so so that's actually uh, putting more uh, burden on the receiver uh, in which case you don't have a choice but to go for a, a APD receiver over here APD based receiver so you can at least get a gain of 20 uh, from the APD and uh, then of course you have to have more amplifiers uh, so if you do all that calculation you will probably find that if you want to get 1 meter spatial resolution you are not going to be able to support 20 dB dynamic range maybe you will be able to support only uh, like 10 dB dynamic range and so on so you, you need to have that trade off uh, in, in all of this ok. So those are the typical issues that we face uh, when we are uh, going about designing an OTDR and these concepts are once again relevant to the case of uh, doing a free space OTDR instead of a fiber you launch light into free space uh, there again you have to uh, do a power budget like that what we did here whatever we did here this is actually a power budgeting so you, you do the power budget, you do the rise time budget uh, just like you do for a communication application right and uh, then you can actually achieve uh, the end result uh, after, after going through this process. So that will be the same if you are doing it in uh, free space as well ok. Um, and, uh, and of course we will come back and look at a OTDR uh, from the perspective of uh, distributed sensing uh, uh, later uh, in the semester when we go to uh, Raman and Ruan OTDR and all that ok. So that is it for now.